Hello, good, e good evening, and welcome to the session on hypertension and cardiovascular diseases, as well as diabetes mellitus. My name is Sazli Kasim. I'm the chair for this session, and I'm a consultant cardiologist with University Technology Mara in Malaysia. And I have for you three speakers today, uh, three fantastic speakers who I will introduce one by one. Um, this session on hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes uh, will go on for about an hour. If you do have any questions, please use the Q&A session. We'll first introduce the first speaker, which is Dr. Gilbert Villela from the Department of Internal Medicine and Cardiology from the Philippines Heart Center. He is also the president for Philippines Heart Association. And he is talking on a topic very relevant to all of us, considering we're a population of 700 million people in Southeast Asia on diabetes and heart failure in preserved ejection fraction. Dr. Vilela, if you please. Good day, everyone. Over the past years, the management approaches, the diagnosis, interventions of heart failure has grown by leaps and bounds. But what about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Plus, diabetes is a growing concern over the Asian region. What is the link between the two? Understanding diabetes and HEPFEF would bring us closer to improved treatment outcomes. First, I'd like us to uh, realize that when we talk about heart failure, we're talking about the right side of the cardiovascular continuum, the end of the CV continuum. Heart failure is the worst CV disease. It is the worst form of cardiovascular disease. And Whereas diabetes, diabetes is at the left end of the continuum. It is in the risk factors. And may I remind everyone that diabetes is stage A heart failure. If practitioners did not control or were not able to control diabetes mellitus, then the patient heart condition would go to stage B heart failure, meaning the stage of structural remodeling where you have ventricular enlargement or probably ischemia or, or uh, dyskinesias or hyperkinesias, but the patient does not have symptoms yet. So this is stage B. But once the patient develops volume overload, there you go, the patient will progress to stage C, symptomatic heart failure. And if not abated, would go into advanced stage, stage D heart failure. But today, our topic is HEPF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And I'm talking about symptomatic heart failure with an LV ejection fraction of more than 50% or 50% and above. HEPF is not half rep. That is the reason why there is no success with the treatment of HEPF because we've been using interventions for half rep. HEPF has preserved systolic ejection fraction basically very different hemodynamics from HEFREF. There is no LV dilatation, there's concentric LV remodeling, and there's diastolic LV dysfunction. And during this diastole, when the LV and the LA behaves as a single chamber because the vital valve is open, that increased LV and diastolic pressure from diastolic LV dysfunction and concentric LV remodeling will be transmitted direct to, directly to the LA, to the left atrium. And from the left atrium, what, what, uh, 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 what drips to the LA is the pulmonary veins. That pressure from the LV to the LA will be transmitted directly to the pulmonary veins and up to the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures causing dyspnea shortness of breath and orthopnea and a lot of things associated with heart failure. Survival rates are similar for both HEPF and HEFREF patients. At five years, mortality rate is 65%. My gosh. And look at the median survival rate by age group as compared to the median survival in years per age, which is in the red bars. It is really very frustrating and scary. HEPREF and HEPF have similar signs and symptoms. That's why you cannot really diagnose it clinically, very simply. Plus, they have similar 
worse or, or worse limitations, especially in uh, exercise, like showering and bathing, dressing, walking, climbing, sometimes have, have, have worse uh, exercise tolerance than have ref patients. It is a myth that we truly understand the etiology of HEF, -HEF. but we all, we all thought that it really is coming from diastolic dysfunction, probably from dysfunctional calcium handling, probably from the spring-like titan protein, or probably from increased extracellular fibrosis, reduced ventricular compliance and shift in the pressure volume relationship. This is the, di the, the diagram. Antecedent diabetes will cause hemodynamic load and metabolic load on the left ventricle, and it will stimulate sympathetic and parasympathetic imbalance and the stimulation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Angiotensin II induces oxidative stress and activates nuclear factor kappa B and induces the expression of inflammatory cytokines and markers such as interleukin-6 and HSCRP, which will stimulate inflammation and a lot of fibrosis as, as measured by ST2, pentaxin, and galactin. Diagrammatically, the hemodynamic load will cause cardiomyocyte hypertrophy, the metabolic load and the inflammation will cause extracellular matrix fibrosis, which are both contributing to concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, plus the effect on titan, which makes it very tense. Titan is the molecular spring of our sarcomeres. If it's very tight, then you have diastolic dysfunction. Metabolic syndrome as manifested by obesity is directly related. A lot of evidence shows it is directly related to the incidence of hep -F. In fact, it comes from hypertensive remodeling and probably from metabolic syndrome and metabolic stresses on the LV, causing global loss of cardiac, vascular, and peripheral reserve, manifesting as HEPF. That's why uh, diet and exercise work for patients with HEPF. It has been shown that it improves LV function by measuring peak VO2, which is really one of the gold standards of uh, prognosticating heart failure. It also improves patient symptoms as manifested in the KCCQ overall score. Diabetes is a key risk factor for heart failure. In fact, it is called stage A condition. We have to emphasize this to everyone because at stage A, you can still stop the progressive uh, cardiovascular disease called heart failure. And the large proportion of this type 2 diabetes patients develop structural heart abnormalities, hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, very stiff heart, and this other volume of load will push you into stage C, a symptomatic heart failure. So LV remodeling plus volume overload will progress to stage C heart failure. The one that we usually uh, grade by NIHA score, grade two, three, four. Now, it is an insidious disease that starts before the first symptoms. It starts from diabetes, and then you, you were not able to control its cardiometabolic effects. It progresses to LV remodeling. And then because the control is not yet established, and it is accompanied by probably by hypertension or probably by coronary art arteriosclerosis, it will develop into stage C because of progressive remodeling and sustained positive fluid balance. So LV remodeling plus a positive fluid balance or LV volume overload will produce worse heart failure symptoms and stages. Prevalence, well, in a 605 type two diabetes study of, more, of people more than 60 years old, uh, 2.5, of them are diagnosed to have heart failure, but 22.5% uh, are undiagnosed. So 22.5 of diabetic patients more than 60 years old in New Zealand, as reported by Booman de Winter, were not diagnosed. What is the mechanism? Well, inflammation, which causes fibrosis 
and diastolic dysfunction because it, the, depo the deposition of collagen and fibrin into the LV and extracellular matrix makes it, makes it very, very stiff. Plus hypertension, which causes hypertrophy and apoptosis. It also causes atherosclerosis, but it is more related to HEF-REF because of reduction in perfusion from coronary artery disease. How do you diagnose it? First, by symptoms, signs and symptoms of shortness of breath, disfatigability, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea probably, plus corroborated by an elevated NT pro BNP or plasma BNP. Then you have to request for to trans thoracic to the echo to really see the abnormality anatomically and to diagnose the ejection fraction. You also have to find out the antecedent comorbid disease that pushed the half pef because you really have to also treat the antecedent comorbid disease. There's a tool developed by Ready, published in circulation in 2018. It's called H2FPEF score, which takes into consideration the weight of the patient, whether the patient is hypertensive, whether the patient has atrial fibrillation or pulmonary hypertension, as seen by 2D echoes, pulmonary systolic pressure more than 35 millimeters mercury, age 60 and above, and a filling pressure from echo finding of an E over E prime of more than nine. If you see this in your patient, then most probably the patient has had PEF. Why do we have to say it to show you this? Because we have to diagnose it very early on so that we can prevent worsening heart failure phase. Again, we have to diagnose them very early on so that you can prevent worsening heart failure phase so that the patient will be stopped at that stage and treated properly. Now, the role of echo in the diagnosis of HEPF is, uh, cannot be overemphasized. You're looking for an ejection fraction of more than 50%, left ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular and LA dilatation, probably increased in LA volume index, regional wall motion abnormalities and diastolic dysfunction. These are the things that you should look for at to the echo. Also, you could request for NT, pro BNP or BNP, plasma BNP levels. But take note that NP levels may be normal in up to 30% of patients with HEPF because of the very thick myocardium. If you compare HEPF from HEPREF, meaning systolic heart failure versus diastolic heart failure, really, Diastolic heart failure has lower BNP and lower end diastolic wall stress. Now, the goals of therapy in heart failure is one, if it can be prevented, you have to prevent it from progression. So diagnosing people with hypertension and diabetes and smoking and obesity is very important. You have to screen if they have symptoms of heart failure. If, if they have, then you request for NT pro BNP and you request for 2D echo to establish a diagnosis. And second, you want to reduce death and hospitalization. You want to stop worsening heart failure. And then you, want, you would like to bring them back to their jobs. You have to decrease the symptom burden and improve their physical exertion and quality of life. Now, current clinical management of heart failure with pre-served ejection fraction has four major focus. First, blood pressure. Second is volume of load. Second is the skeletal muscle dysfunction. As we all know, heart failure is a catabolic state. And you have to diagnose the, and treat the comorbidities. Let's talk about heart blood pressure. If the blood pressure is at goal, meaning less than 130, but not lower than 120, because there is a J curve. This is a J curve that they saw. You know? The larger the LV, the more significant is the J curve. If the patient's blood pressure is less than 130 over 80, you continue the current treatment. But if it is not, you treat the hypertension following the current guidelines, meaning rust blockers plus a diuretic or probably plus an a a CCB and beta blocker. Volume overload, you have, if the patient has an increasing symptom, like there's worsening of his symptoms, you may add look, diuretics and consider spironolactone. And you should control his sodium diet 
and you must ask them to weigh themselves daily. Any increase by three to five pounds in a week is a signal that the patient is going into worsening heart failure phase. But if the patient's evolemic, you just maintain them on a low sodium diet, but you still ask them for daily weight monitoring so that you can see whether there's really stability or a slow progression. We all know heart failure is a catabolic state, so you will lose a lot of protein cardiac cachexia. So you have to diagnose it and then push them into cardiac rehabilitation so that it would not worsen the prognosis. Cardiac cachexia and heart failure worsens the prognosis. And you probably have to give them protein supplement in the diet, probably 1.1 grams per kilogram per day of protein for patients with heart failure. You have to diagnose and treat comorbidities like CKD, obesity, AF, diabetes, CAD, COPD, OSA, anemia, and chronotropic incompetence. You have to address them all to get an, a complete better treatment outcome. Now, what about treatments? There have been several HEPF trials, but all of them failed, meaning they were, the, the results you know, all fell on top of the line of neutrality. So giving them kind of certain irbisartan, perindipril or spironolactone, sacripital valsartan and digoxin, HEPF patients are neutral, meaning they did not improve the outcomes of treatment, mortality and morbidity and hospitalization for heart failure. So the guidelines, 2021 ESC guidelines, just last August 27, 2021 said, there are no treatments indicated to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death for HEPF patients, for patients with preserved ejection fraction. But a few hours later, this study was uh, conducted, the Emperor Preserved Trial, and by, Stephen, by Professor Stephen Anker. It is the empaglyphosin and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I placed it here because this is the first ever, the first ever trial that is positive, that is shown to decrease mortality and to decrease hospitalization for heart failure among patients with preserved ejection fraction. And look at this. The benefit was seen as early as 18 days, 18 big days after randomization with a risk reduction of 21% and an NNTF only 31. Wonderful results. Plus, this is more interesting. The effect on worsening heart failure events, it stopped, it stopped. Heart failure hospitalization requiring IV uh, vasopressors or inotropes, it stopped requiring CCU, ICU admission, and it stopped intensification of further diuretics. Great. More than anything else, empagliflozin protected the kidney by significantly slowing the decline in kidney function. You know, the heart and the kidneys, they're twins. If you treat the other one and improve it, the other one would also improve. And it is very important because CKD increases significantly mortality and adverse outcomes of heart failure treatment. So many mechanisms, well, Glucose, it increases glucosuria, which decreases glucose toxicity and inflammation and oxidative stress, thereby decreasing LV stiffening. Reduction in calories, weight loss, but more importantly, you decrease epicardial adipose tissue, which is uh, related to more inflammation in the myocardium. You decrease insulin glucagon ratio, you improve myocardial ATP production and improve myocardial energy usage. What about sodium? You improve the tubular glomerular uh, feedback by in increasing afferent arterial constriction and decreasing glomerular hypertension. You also decrease intracellular sodium in cardiomyocytes through a reduction in cardiac sodium hydrogen exchange. And you, you drop or you reduce ventricular arrhythmias. Plus you also slightly reduce blood pressure causing reduction in arterial stiffness. Hemodynamically, you decrease plasma volume. In fact, 
there have been reports that among HFREF patients, it is very good tandem with loop diuretics. It, redu it reduces cardiac preload, reduces cardiac afterload, and increases hematocrit. So there have been a lot of uh, mechanisms suggested why SGLT2 inhibitors improve treatment outcomes for HEPPEF patients. So therefore, as my conclusion, HEPPEF currently accounts for approximately half of heart failure cases, but is increasing in prevalence. The risk of mortality in HEPPEF and HEPREP is comparably high, but mortality in HEPPEF is more likely to be influenced by comorbid conditions. Patients with HEPPEF have impaired quality of life and limited functional capacity. Emperor Preserve is the first ever trial to show positive outcomes on HEPPEF. Comorbid conditions drive systemic inflammation that ultimately contributes to myocardial remodeling in HEPPEF patients. As GLT2 inhibitors have favorable impact on adiposity, vascular function, cardiac function, metabolism, and renal function. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Villala. Um, and that was a very comprehensive and uh, direct um, overview of heart failure preserve ejection fraction, very pertinent, and it uh, affects a lot of our patients with diabetes. Our next speaker is Dr. Somkhat Sangwatanaraj from uh, Chulalongkorn University. He's a senior consultant with the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, Department of Medicine, and Faculty of Medicine in Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. His lecture will be on home-based blood pressure monitoring devices. He has been uh, publishing uh, quite a number of paper on this, actually, and it is something that is, again, relevant to all of us in terms of controlling hypertension, one of the driver for cardiovascular disease. Dr. Somkhet Sangwatanaraj, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, my topic is on the personal rapture monitoring device. Now, first of all, I have no conflict of interest to declare in this topic, okay? Uh, as you know, that uh, we taught uh, the children to have the cell toothbrushing for cell management to prevent the dental caries. But now I think it's time that the, everyone at home uh, should have the tooth how to measure their blood pressure uh, instead of the hospital based blood pressure measurement, uh, especially during the COVID 19 pandemics. And this is a cell care prevention recommended by the American Heart Association. That's the daily blood pressure measurement in hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and coronary heart disease patients. And in Thailand, uh, our society, uh, Thai Hypertension Society, two years ago uh, launched a guideline. And this is the first time that we recommend the whole blood pressure monitoring and angiography by patient monitoring in the high normal and possible probable hypertension patients. And for the blood pressure measurement device, the, the WHO specification uh, divided to non-invasive and invasive. So we don't use the invasive measurement for the in the clinic. And the, for the non-invasive, we have the manual this is a classical use stethoscope and here to use the holotop sound to measure the blood pressure. And also now we use the automate at home to use the oscillation, oscillation pattern to calculate the cyclic acid blood pressure. And uh, the cuffless technique now is not suitable and still not recommended because there is the lack of universal standard. So we don't speak in here. And uh, also we have another type of the hybrid, the non-invasive aperture, is include the, all the manual and all the automatic pressure measurement. And uh, uh, we have the LCD and LED display with low manometer instead of mercury and aneroid. And for the automated cuff, but pressure, we have the most tubeless but pressure measurement device, smart. It's 
extreme no manometer for clinical use. Uh, for the LCD display and this uh, for the hybrid system, we can, uh, can use the manual or automatic. And this is another website. This is an Irish hypertension society for the uh, home pressure monitoring, home use pressure monitoring. And this is the kind of the semi automated cuff blood pressure measurement device. And for the, the tubeless, tubeless technology, we have several kinds of measurement without any tubes. Uh, and uh, also some of them has the internet and can do the telehealth and can kind of attacking and monitoring on time, online, directly to the, the doctor and for the nurses in the hospital. So there are three websites that you can find the validated or standard home blood pressure monitoring devices. The third one is the stipp.org. This is the website that you can find the validated home blood pressure monitoring, office blood pressure monitoring, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, blood pressure measurement for children and device for the pregnant woman. And for the semi-automated uh, versus the automated blood pressure monitoring device, uh, usually the semi-automated, we have to use our hand grip to increase uh, the pressure in the cuff. So this is our fellows who did some study that compare with the patient use the semi-automate with the automate blood pressure device. And they found that the semi-automate device can increase the hand grip strength for about 1.7 kilo, kilogram in about three months compared to about 0.4 in the automated blood pressure. And every uh, one kilometer that increased the hand grip strength is decreased the mortality about 3%, decreased the mortality. So I think that the semi-automated that blood pressure device maybe have some useful for training the hand grip strength of the patients. And how about the differentiary? versus the inflationary. Because the classical, when you measure blood pressure, usually we measure during the different, different the general time of patient. But there is a new kind of the many pressure device that measure during the infrared. Is there any difference between these two kinds of measurement? Usually the inflationary blood pressure measurement is used less than 20 seconds for complete the uh, pressure measurement. But the, for the different age, different, different channelary blood pressure is used more than 20 seconds. So in the emergency room, that uh, we have the faster measurement of blood pressure with the infection rate. And uh, for the higher, higher physical blood pressure, the infrared is measured less than the differentiary coefficient. But the coefficient of these two kind of measurement is not very well. Another that can use the inferentiary blood pressure is the pregnancy and the pre diagnosis of hypertension. There's only these two kind of model of the blood pressure use the inferentiary information infection rate by pressure measurement and it's also passed the British Hamilton Society in the pregnancy at we can share cystic by pressure and that's it by pressure measurement. And uh, another thing that's mentioned in the visual specification is the automatic pre-reading. Why you have to use this automatic pre-reading? There are many kinds of the by pressure device that have the average mode that they can measure three, three times and show only one result of the blood pressure for the average of the three measurements. And this is a, a person, a, a patient 
that usually there is the lower pressure for the second uh, pressure measurement after one minute, after the first pressure minute, usually it's lower. But this patient, the half of the pressure measurement has the higher the second pressure measurement. So the usually is the overestimate the pressure of the patient because they saw the pressure uh, number and they quite excited. And after that, the, the pressure is go higher. So if we use the automate, we have the more average of the pressure. And, and this is another uh, elderly woman that has the days keep the antihypertensive medication for several days and came with the very high blood pressure, the straight three heart blood pressure. And after automatic treating, it's also very high blood pressure. So usually sometimes we have to admit the patients, but we use the telemonitoring blood pressure device and they, they measure the blood pressure after they end home and uh, all the data sent to the, the office. And also they capture the page, uh, the picture of the blood pressure. They confirm that the uh, blood pressure is lower at home. And after that, a few days, this is another of the three highest blood pressure. And after they have the medication and measure the blood pressure at home, it's stable of the blood pressure. It's another useful for the home blood pressure device that some of them have the atrial fibrillation detection model, such as these uh, patients, they have the irregular and total irregular uh, oscillometric pattern, right? This. And also they, uh, in the machine, they told that maybe the atrial fibrillation. And after the monitoring, it's also shown that the atrial fibrillation has been diagnosed. And for the chronic atrial fibrillation, uh, many pressure device is the not the, in the recommendation because there are only one measurement that uh, pass the <clears throat> protocol or standard validation. So usually for the chronic atrial fibrillation, the pressure is uh, used have to use the manual pressure measurement. This is another way that we we use the. <clears throat> Automated home blood pressure, the tubeless one. We put the timer into this machine. Uh, and after that, every 15 minutes, it automatically uh, measure the blood pressure and they send to the crowd. And we can see that the mean blood pressure. Yeah. But because of there is many artifacts, this is a signal for the artifact because there is the motion artifact. For some time patient, this the is speaking or driving the car. So there the are many kinds of the motion artifact. But if we use the alarm clock, the alarm system in the application, in the phone, in the smartphone, and uh, they have to, um, they have to put uh, to on the professional measurement by yourself every time they can, they can stop uh, moving. And so there is no motion artifact. we can maybe diagnose this of the whole spectrum hypotension. This is a, a campaign that we uh, campaigned the home blood pressure monitoring maybe five years ago. We, uh, for, for the 90 hospital and for in, in three years, we include more than 3,000 cases of the uh, home blood pressure monitoring patients. This is the data of the 65 hospital in the in this cohort. And last year we published the first uh, 
more than 1,000 home practitioner monitoring patients. And we found that the highest unemployment is the more than 60 years old men. And after for, for one year, this year, uh, we opened the second uh, home practitioner monitoring for up for one year. And we found that the patient, clinic patient is lower, about 2.8 millimeter mercury in one year. It's comparable to the intervention, such as the nutrition is a 2.3, and also the exercise is a 1.7 millimeter. So we, we thought that the home blood pressure would do is the intervention to lower their blood pressure. This is my favorite uh, personal blood pressure monitoring device. So if you want to detect the heart rate at your fibrillation, use the cloud base. That is uh, especially for tracking the blood pressure, I have the alert system and automatic police breathing system. And also you can use for training and research. We favor this uh, measurement. And if you want to have some hand grip something, we use this kind of measurement. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Somket. Um, Dr. Vilala, Dr. Somket, uh, please join me uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, that was a very good uh, lecture given by the, by the two of you. Uh, unfortunately, our, our third speaker, Prof. Rashid, uh, could not join us this afternoon. Uh, to, due to some technical glitch. Um, however, uh, it's now about uh, quarter to six, so I think we are doing great in terms of timing. Um, we don't have any questions yet, but maybe I can uh, ask uh, Dr. Bilela. Um, when you see uh, patients with um, a diabetes and uh, potentially a diabetic cardiomyopathy in your clinic, I mean, with the EMPA data just coming out, um, how do you advise them um, in terms of reducing the risk and in terms of controlling the symptoms? Any specific uh, tips or tricks that you can share with us? Thank you very much. Uh, great question. First of all, you really have to first establish whether the patient is hypervolemic or euvolemic because you really do have to uh, diarise the patient if the patient is hypervolemic. Now, uh, there has been a lot of studies done on empagliflozin with regards it's stopping or it's uh, controlling the worsening heart failure phase. Uh, it is very effective in preventing hypervolemia, especially if the patient is being given loop diuretics. In fact, in my practice, I have really stopped already using uh, hydrochlorothiazide in combination with loop diuretics because I find SGLT2 better with regards improving uh, naturesis because it, uh, the SGLT2 will stop the reabsorption of sodium in the proximal tubules, increasing the delivery of the sodium into the uh, periphery in the distal tubule and then macula densa, therefore increasing the release or the excretion of sodium. And I don't have any side effects, unlike when I give hydrothiazide, I do get a lot of hyponatremia, hypokalemia with SGLT2, I don't get it. So my advice is, first of all, uh, you must uh, advise your patients to measure their weight at home, get a personal weighing scale and use that weighing scale uh, every day do not weigh themselves in other weighing scales because those, because weighing scales are not standardized. And then any increase by uh, of 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 uh, weight by around five pounds per week is a sign, a signal that uh oh, the patient is already uh, reabsorbing uh, reabsorbing a lot of fluids and salt, and is about to go into symptoms again. So you 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 look for that. And if, you, if the physician finds himself escalating diuretics, increasing steadily the loop diuretics, this because of the patient's symptoms of uh, shortness of breath and bipedal edema, then the patient is already on the, in the worsening heart failure phase. So you better, uh, you should have started the patients on SGLT2 in the beginning. 
That's a great answer. I think what you mentioned is also very relevant, uh, which is SGLT as a glucose sodium um, blocker and delivering higher um, glucose and sodium to the distant nephrons, um, increasing right. osmotic diuresis, uh, which leads to Dr. Samathan Raj. Um, you're an expert in high blood pressure and a sodium <laughs> intake is uh, a huge, huge problem. Um, yeah. What do you think would SGLT2 inhibitor be in, um, one of the drugs <laughs> to control hypertension in the future? Um, actually, I, I think that the SGLT2 inhibitor is just like the diuretic in hypertension. You use this to treat the hyperglycemia, right? So it's decrease or secrete of the glucose, the same as you use diuretic to treat the sodium overload in hypertension because you actually the sodium. I think it's the same principle for treatment, but the other um, other mechanism, we still uh, don't know what is the mechanism. So I, I personally use the home blood pressure measurement so we can, maybe we can classify the patients that what is the response uh, for antihypertensive in this patient. Such as we use a diuretic. I use only one diuretic. And after that, if the blood pressure is lower, so I told the patient that you have the sodium overload. Right? Ah. So we use the sodium channel blocker or as inhibitor. Ah, the blood pressure is low. I told the patient that you have the high peripheral vascular system. So how you improve your vascular system, just exercise, right? You move your hand, your foot, your leg. It's the vasodilatation. So it's the counteract to the, the vasoconstriction that the doc, doc can do that. But if you cannot do okay, give the doctor do that instead of you. Also, some patients have a very exciting, very easy exercise. They saw the doctor and blood pressure high. So we know that these are more sympathetic tone. So if the beta blocker good to lower the blood pressure, so you have to do some, maybe something that can you slow your heart rate, or <laughs> slow your excitation, such as maybe some breathing exercise, or some uh, meditation, even meditation, we say a prayer sometimes. So it's a, this is uh, how we use the uh, anti evidence to suitable for the each patient. So I think that uh, in, near the, in the near future, we should have some kind of the personalized medicine or the individualized anti evidence for our patients. So they can learn from their lifestyle by the home patient that we measure every day. Maybe we have to measure during their work. In the, in the workplace also, or in the weekend, to see any factors that involve the blood pressure. I think maybe it's the same lifestyle medication, or we call lifestyle medicine for the diabetes too. You can use the, the, the capillary blood glucose. Because my mother has a diabetes at 80, 80 something, 83 years old. They got the diabetes because of the depression after my father died. Yeah. So she want to have some uh, orange juice. So you can have your orange juice, but after two, two hours, I call for the blood pressure, uh, blood glucose. And for after the, the, the orange juice, the blood glucose higher than 300. So I told her that you cannot have this after half, half bottom. Half bottom is about 200. And so it's only two spoonful of the orange juice. It's less than 180. I said, okay, you can have only two. <laughs> two. Just like, like this, we do the same as the hypertension or the <laughs> diabetes to teach the patient. But if you can, okay, you have to start the medication. But I think the medication make the same that the lifetime medication, but maybe it's more potent, it's more easy way to do. Right. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this point in time, um, home blood pressure monitoring is a huge leap in terms of getting our patients' uh, blood pressure control. It gives patients more empowerment, more responsibility. They can see the reaction to medicine. They can see the reaction to lack of sleep, to stress, to uh, illnesses, which is fantastic. But however, sometimes I do still have patients, and I think a lot of us would, say this, would face the same problem. Um, choosing the types of monitor. And I think your last slide was very good. It shows three different brands um, that has different accuracies and utility. Um, what are your thoughts? And I open this question to both speakers for the uh, wrist uh, blood pressure monitor system and also the cuffless uh, BP monitoring system. You mentioned briefly in your talk, Dr. Sangatanaraj, maybe um, you could elaborate a tiny bit more. Uh, for the cupless technology, is still not set down because there is no universal standard of this. You use your smartphone, put on your wrist, or you use some uh, wristband that, that can measure the, the blood pressure, but it's still not really accurate. And also, the, it depends on the many situations. So, it, maybe we have to use uh, to wait for the, this technology to have to settle some standard and we can measure it instead of the, uh, the cuff of pressure. Uh, yeah. Have, yeah, sure. yeah. I, I agree, uh, but it, uh, it is a new development. It's a wonderful uh, forward yeah. development for measurement outside of the office. But it has to be proven first before we start, before we use it uh, for our patients. My, my thoughts on the wrist blood pressure, uh, I'm quite scared because uh, in the periphery, there's the higher resistance and we could be getting a false blood pressure measurement. So I, I would advise my patients to uh, use the uh, upper arm blood pressure monitor because it is closer to the central aortic pressure. And uh, as we all know, central aortic pressure is the, before it was a target really of uh, blood pressure lowering. If you decrease central aortic blood pressure, you not only decrease the blood pressure, but you get improved outcomes from decreasing afterload from for the LV and decreasing also LV size on LV hypertrophy. So I am I, I'm more comfortable with using the uh, upper arm blood pressure monitor for my patients. Thank you. The, the, those two are great answers. It's a space to, there's an evolving space. I mean, um, sensor technologies are getting smaller and smaller, and I think we don't keep up. <laughs> a lot of the engineers out there will start doing a lot of uh, funny things that we're not comfortable with, um, and that would be a bit disturbing for us clinicians. Um, gentlemen, it's close to 6 p.m., uh, the two of you have been great. Um, there are no questions from the audience, uh, which uh, is okay. It's not too bad. It means that you've delivered the lectures very su successfully and uh, it's very well understood. Uh, thank you very much uh, for spending time with us this afternoon, this evening. I hope we could eventually meet up at the next AFCC <laughs> or if not sooner. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. with we'll that again, thank you. Yeah. Have a good evening and uh, good luck. <laughs> good luck. Bye. Good night.